He is the king. He's the king of Israel. He's, he's the king of creation. He's the king of grace. He's the king of government. No, on this occasion when the Lord Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he entered as the king of Israel. When he was delivered up four days later, it was as the king rejected. And when he rose again the third day, it was as the king victorious. And he ascended to the right hand of his father, according to Psalm 24, as the king of glory. And thank God he's coming back again someday as the king of glory. And without saying this is the proper exposition or the exegetical interpretation of the 24th Psalm, it's still a wonderful thing to realize that you were invited to fling open the gates. And I don't care if it's the gates of your home, or the gates of your heart, or the gates of the church, or the gates of the nation, but when the gates are flung open, the King of Glory will come in. You know what's wrong in your life today? If it's all wrong, what you need is the entrance of the King of Glory. If your home is in darkness and confusion, you need the entrance of the King of Glory. If the church is dead, it needs the entrance of the King of Glory. If America is perishing, and it is, it needs the entrance of the King of Glory. And bless God where the gates are flung open, and let me tell you that in itself is a product of grace, for it's all of grace. But when the gates are flung open, the King of Glory shall come in. Jesus says, don't be blinded by first appearances. I am the King. The Romans, they probably would have laughed at that. As they see him coming, the king riding on a donkey. Come, it's Roman Caesars, don't ride on donkeys. But don't be fooled by appearances. Jesus says, I am the king. I think there's a second reason why he asserted himself with such publicity at this time. And why he reveals himself as the king. And that is to show us his love. See, the atoning blood of, of the Lamb of God was about to be shed. He came to Jerusalem to die, and he desired that all should know it. When the time came for him to die, he made a public entry into Jerusalem. And by doing this, he was proclaiming that the events of a few days later would not be as the high priests wanted it to be, it would not be something done in secret or done in a corner. By gathering the thousands around him and by focusing this public attention on himself, Jesus was guaranteeing that everybody in Jerusalem would understand and be aware of what was happening on that dreadful day of crucifixion. So by drawing attention to himself, he was saying, today you see me as the king. Follow me four days and you'll see the king become the Lamb. See, the sufferings that he would shortly endure were completely voluntary. Just as Jesus Christ was able to make winds and waves and diseases and devils submit to his authority, so he was also able, when it pleased him, to turn the minds of men according to his will. We read in some of the accounts how the men of Nazareth could not hold him uh, but when he chose to pass through the midst of them and go his way, uh, the angry Jews of Jerusalem couldn't detain him, and they would have laid violent hands on him in the temple. But going through the midst of them, he passed by. Above all, the very soldiers who apprehended him in the garden at the first uh, went backward and fell to the ground. See, there's something about our Lord during his whole earthly ministry. As the prophet Habakkuk says, uh, which was a mysterious hiding of his divine power. He had almighty power when he was pleased to use it. We might wonder, why then did he not resist his enemies? Why did he not scatter that band of soldiers who came to seize him like chaff before the wind? I think there's but one answer to that this morning. He was willing to suffer and die in order to procure redemption for a lost and ruined world. Now, he had undertaken to 
give his life as a ransom that we might live forever. And he laid his life down willingly on the cross with all the desire of his heart. He did not bleed and suffer and die because he was vanquished by a superior foe and could not help himself, but because he loved us and rejoiced to give himself for us as our substitute. He did not die because he could not avoid death, but because he was willing with all his heart to make his soul an offering for sin. Uh, F.B. Meyer has noted in his uh, commentary on the Gospel of John that it was love, and only love, that kept him standing before Pilate, bending beneath the scourge of soldiers, hanging in apparent helplessness on the cross. It was not the iron hand of relentless fate, not the overpowering numbers of closely woven plans of his foes, not the nails that pierced his quivering flesh. No, it was none of these. It was not even the compulsion of the divine purpose. It was his own choice, because of a love that would bear all things, if only it might achieve <coughs> redemption for those whom he loved more than himself. May we always bear in mind those wonderful words of the Apostle, He loved me and gave Himself for me. How great that is the tenderness and the compassion of Christ toward a world of lost and guilty sinners. As Jesus drew near to the city for this last time, knowing full well the character of the inhabitants of the city, their injustice, in their cruelty and what they were about to do to him in a few days' time. Yet as we read in our passage this morning, he stopped and he wept over it. His sufferings and his crucifixion, he knew they were all spread out before his mind's eye, and yet he pitied Jerusalem. He stopped, he beheld the city, and he wept over it. You might recall in Bethany, he had wept at the grave of Lazarus in sympathy with the mourners. Very soon in Gethsemane, he would weep in agony. But here, over Jerusalem, he weeps in horror at the prospect of the terrible sufferings that lay just ahead of the city and its people. Because he knew that despite all of the excitement of this day, in the few days following, in this very city, he would be rejected. And there, he would die the death of the cross. And he knew that the cost of that rejection for Jerusalem and her people would be both deadly and for a prolonged duration. And this is why he wept over the city. And who, knowing what Jesus knew, wouldn't weep at the vision of the destruction of a great people. Where a few days later, a crowd would again gather around Jesus in Jerusalem. This time outside the palace of Antonia, where the Roman governor resided. And there they would cry, Crucify him! Crucify him! His blood be on us and on our children. And Pontius Pilate held out Christ and he said, Behold the man! And then he said, Behold your king! Is there not an echo in that of the cry which four days earlier had reverberated around the city of Jerusalem? Blessed is the king. And now Pilate is saying, Behold your king. And what was the people's answer? We have no king but Caesar. Away with him. We will not have this man. Crucify him. And Pilate says, Crucify your king? The people's response, No, Pilate, Caesar is our king. They rejected the very king whose name had been lifted up as he rode on the donkey into Jerusalem in his triumphal entry a few days prior. And on that fateful day, it proved that Christ had been right to weep over Jerusalem. The results were predictable. As you come some 40 years later, the Roman general Titus and his armies reduced Jerusalem to rubble and butchered and banished and branded as slaves or citizens. 
It was clear then that the Savior's grief had not been misplaced. It was equally clear that his warning had gone unheeded. That was a tragedy of epic proportions, the echoes of which are being heard and felt around the world today. As Christ had lamented, Jerusalem was destroyed. But that's really only a shadow of the destruction that awaits those who reject the King. You know, I have, I have feebly attempted this morning to show you the revelation of the King. But our time here is almost gone, but I trust that you have been moved to recognize Him. But don't stop there. Because you can recognize simply with your mind. You can intellectually agree that He is the King. But listen, it is not with the head that man believes. Yes, the intellect must be instructed. But this is not primarily an intellectual matter. This is not something for philosophical argument. Paul says in Romans 10, with the heart, man believes. It's a matter of the will, of that citadel, of the soul. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Don't stop short today of receiving Christ. See, sin could only have been dealt with by the shedding of the blood of God's Lamb. It's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And when the mighty king became the lamb, he shed his blood. And because he is the king, God manifested in the flesh. And yet because he is man, truly man without sin, he could shed his blood and there would be power in the blood of the lamb. And there's kingly power in Jesus' blood today. There's power to cleanse from all sin. There's power to cleanse a guilty conscience. There's power to deliver from the inbred dominion of sin. There's power to set you free from condemnation. There's power to save you from hell. There's power to give you victory over the flesh and the devil. There's power to make you a new creature in Jesus Christ. There's power in the blood of the Lamb because it was the King who became the Lamb. If God's spoken to you today about Christ, the King of grace and glory, the command of Scripture is to receive Him. Make sure you don't stop short of receiving Him today. For this King who came the first time is coming back again. Let's bow our heads. Today, after this feeble presentation of the word, I don't think that we can deny the identity of this king. He is God. He is man. He is the Savior. I think most of you here today would at least intellectually recognize his claims. But when you receive him as your king, and your Savior, your Lord, the king laments the folly of sinners who stand outside the kingdom of his grace. And I can't save you this morning. But if you wish to seek me out after the service, I can tell you of the one who can. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Come, reason, repent, and receive the king. As Pilate was later to say those famous words, What shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? Whatever he may have meant by those words, you know the meaning of them for you today. What will you do with Jesus? Will you recognize him? Will you receive him? Receive him and be saved, for the king will enter in. And if the Bible takes so much time to record the entrance of the king into the city that rejected him, how much more does heaven prize the entrance of the king into the heart of him that received him? Once you receive the king today,
For as many as received him, to them he gives the power to become the sons of God, as many that believe on his name. And if you're saved here today, he demands your obedience. Do you recognize him as Lord? Do you bow before his authority? Have you surrendered your life as a willing vessel fit for your master's use? O King of my life, I crown thee now, thine may the glory be. Forsaking the world, place the cross before you this morning. Devote your life today to honoring the crown rights of your King and Redeemer. Our Father in heaven, bless thy word. We thank you today for uh, this revelation of Lord Jesus Christ as our King. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. God bless thy word to every heart this morning. Would you be pleased to save the lost? Revive the saints of God. May the King of glory enter into many a heart and a life and a home today. No Lord, may heaven rejoice over souls and sinners repenting to receive the King. We pray you will part us today with your blessing. We give, this, we give thee our thanks. We pray this in Jesus' name.